So, in one of the Facebook groups for ministers that I'm a member of, we were having a conversation just the other day about words of welcome. And we were trying out different phrases and ways of including people and welcoming them and encouraging people to be welcome for the fullness of their identity. We landed on some things here and there. Some of those things worked for a few of us, but not for all of us. And that was then, it was then reading through the comments that I happened upon the idea that the process of being forgiven begins with a welcome. In order to feel like we are more than our biggest mistake, at some point, we must feel welcome even as we bear the consequences of that mistake. And you see, the historical universalists understood this construct very well. Universalism in North America emerges out of the 18th century evangelical fervor of the Great Awakening, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God type of evangelical fervor. And during that same period, our Unitarian forebears, who were then still the Congregationalists, they were still shaking off their Puritanism. It still sticks to us every now and again. But the Universalists, the Universalists entered the conversation about an angry and punitive God by declaring, God is love. That's not new theology. It's not new theology by half. It's, it's a phrase that appears in the New Testament of Christian Bible exactly twice. And if you do different configurations of talking about God's love, it appears more than 70 times throughout Hebrew and Christian Bibles. But nonetheless, while early Universalists believed in a loving God, their conception of the divine still imposed consequences in the afterlife for bad behavior during one's life here on Earth. Most early Universalists are what we would now call restorationists. And restorationists believe that if you had done bad things during your earthly life, that in the afterlife, you first went to a hell-like place. I know, I know, stick with me. <laughs> After an indeterminate period of time, which fit the nature of that offense or those offenses, a period that was only known to the divine itself, everyone was eventually restored to the divine in heaven. If you could not atone for and work through your transgressions during your earthly life, you still had to work for forgiveness in the afterlife. Now, your giggles let me know, you kind of see where this is going. The perspective of necessary suffering in the afterlife it didn't hold for very long. And theological bickering in the late 18th to mid 19th centuries brought it to a clash with a group called the Ultra Universalists. I'm not joking about that term. They were not talking about superpowers. They actually called themselves the Ultra Universalists. And Ultra Universalists believed that if God is truly loving, it would be unthinkable for the divine to require us to suffer before going to heaven. They thought the divine capacity for forgiveness is so vast that we would go immediately to heaven, no matter the effects of the lingering harm we had done on earth. Now, the ultra-universalists, they ultimately won this debate because a God that only loves you when you are perfect and sinless is in fact not an all-loving God. And in turn, ultra-universalism becomes the strain of universalism we inherit as Unitarian Universalists. Now, what I find significant about both the Restorationists and the ultra-universalists is their configurations of forgiveness are ultimate. 
Whereas in some traditions at some point before the end of earthly life, we must directly ask those whom we have injured or the divine itself for forgiveness, in universalism, the divine freely excuses any transgressions once earthly life has ended. There are consequences to this set of beliefs, as there are with any set of beliefs. And with universalism, I think probably the negative consequences of ultimate forgiveness come immediately to mind. To be forgiven in the end by this configuration, we never even need to say I'm sorry. However, I counter with the positive consequences, which are plentiful. We also never need to forgive others if we honestly cannot. They'll be forgiven in the end. We also are not directly responsible for the outcomes others face after this life. The divine forgives all in the end because the project of forgiveness is bigger than people. And I'll add that even ultra-universalists and we as Unitarian Universalists believe atonement in this life is the most desirable outcome. We're, we're still working for that. And theologically, we've embraced an understanding that living out of harmony with one another and the planet creates suffering during this life, which is in fact hell-like. It's not that we want everyone to face no consequences for bad behavior. Rather, it's that if the suffering of being separated from the joy of being fully in community in this life was not enough, how exactly will more suffering in the afterlife fix that? <laughs> All right? It, how does suffering inflicted on others during a fixed period of life warrant an indeterminate period of suffering in the afterlife where one still doesn't have to apologize. That's our project. Unitarians, Universalists, and Unitarian Universalists answer these questions by knowing both we and the divine are bigger than our greatest mistakes. And so by extending the universalist principle that, divine, that the divine welcomes us into whatever is next, knowing what our greatest mistake is, we know that the process of being forgiven also begins with a welcome. In our words of welcome this morning, I reminded you that whoever you are, whomever you love, Wherever you have come from, you are welcome in this sanctuary. There were no conditions. I didn't say you were welcome if you're 55 or older. I didn't say you are welcome if you can produce your citizenship paperwork. I didn't say you are welcome if you're only married to your first partner. I said you're welcome as you are. And I assume correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe none of you is perfect. <laughs> Any perfect people here? No? No? All right, all right. I'm glad I made that assumption correctly. I also expect, just by the sheer commonality of the human experience, that some of you carry great shame and guilt about some part of yourself, or something you have done. And unfortunately, I, I know of no one in this world who can get rid of those feelings for you. I know that after years of therapy and spiritual practice myself, there are still times when I can't forget that time I was rude to my mother when I was eight years old. I won't forget that time in the fourth grade when I threw the frisbee at my best friend during recess. Likewise, I, I can't forget the times that as I've grown older, 
I've not respected someone else's no. Or I've failed to wait to hear their yes. And because of that, I know that some of these relationships, they came to an end. And I believe rightfully so, because who I revealed myself to be on my worst days held truths about our entire relationship that were no longer workable. I know. I know many of you can recall an encounter when you were not at your best. Driven by intense desire for something or anger or hatred or maybe even sheer lack of knowledge, you shoved past someone else's boundaries. Maybe you even hurt someone on purpose. Sometimes, even equally as difficult, you harbored some resentment for someone and wished something bad would happen to that person, and then it did. Unless you are a very skilled practitioner of witchcraft, and I assume a few of you also are, <laughs> the fact that something bad happened to that person probably wasn't your fault. Search your heart. Search your heart or look around this sanctuary and know that someone else in this room, someone else in your workplace, Someone else in your neighborhood harbors feelings just like these of guilt and shame as well. And it is true. It is true that who we are on our worst day is who we really are. That's what Unitarian Universalist minister, the Reverend Elizabeth Wynne, tells us. Our worst behavior, it can even give us some ideas about how we do better the next time we feel the urge to act out. But who we are at our worst is not all of who we are. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe each and every one of you was born a blessing just the way you are just the way your body works, just the way your lover works, just the way your mind works, you were born a blessing. We know that even the blessing that you are, that you are capable of causing great harm in the same way you are capable of doing great good in this world. Sometimes you even do both at the same time. We know, we know, our faith teaches us that you are necessary, you are necessary for the project of human thriving and the goal of beloved community that we strive toward. And like it or not, we know that neither mistake of judgment nor mistake of character can change your inherent worth. I'm going to say that again. Neither mistake of judgment nor mistake of character can change your inherent worth. And by this same token, you do not determine whether or not you merit forgiveness. The scribe takes up this fact in our responsive reading this morning. Stephen Levine reminds us, somewhere, somewhere there is a basket that contains all of our failures. It is a big basket. It wants to know what to do with these. Mercy has no use for them. Mercy has no use for our failures. Now, mercy, it's a theological concept that's related both to grace and forgiveness, both of these things being conditions which are unearned 
in the Unitarian Universalist perspective. Mercy has no use for all of our failures because the goal of mercy is to be forgiven. And being forgiven is not something we get just by feeling bad about or revisiting the harm that we've caused. Now, expressing remorse and empathizing with the targets of our harm is extremely helpful, but by themselves, they do not lead to forgiveness. I'm going to do a little thought experiment now. Take a moment, settle into this moment, and think about a time when you have forgiven someone. Consider the length and complexity of that process. Did you forgive all at once? Are you able to forgive even more over time? Were the feelings of the people or the person you were forgiving important in that forgiveness process? If you have forgiven people that are no longer in your life because you no longer communicate with them or they are no longer living, how was that process of forgiveness different? Now consider being forgiven. How did you know that you were forgiven? How did you feel differently as a result of receiving forgiveness? pray your thinking on forgiveness has reminded you that we still might not even feel like we are worthy of forgiveness when we receive it. And I'm not going to argue with you about that. You always get to have whatever emotional experience you have. but you don't get to behave in ways that center you when you are being forgiven. You don't get to behave in ways that perpetuate harm just because you feel like you are unworthy of forgiveness. As Celia mentioned, and as we sang in our hymn earlier, the Buddhist tradition of loving kindness, loving kindness is a concept held by many different faith traditions, 
but we take it most directly from Buddhism and Unitarian Universalist contexts. It invites us to prepare both for forgiveness and for being forgiven by welcoming loving kindness into ourselves. And this form of love and compassion for self and for others is what the Universalists mean when they say God is love. This form of love and compassion is the type of love we are referencing when we imagine the beloved community. And it all begins with a welcome. Because here's the trickiest part of being forgiven. It requires us to give up control. We don't control the time frame and who forgives us. And while we can and should apologize directly for harm we have caused, sometimes the transgression we have committed is so distant or impacts so many people that even remorse will not increase the odds of being forgiven. And yet our current understanding of universalism helps us focus on what we can control. We can control knowing that we and that others are worthy and whole beyond our greatest mistakes. We can control welcoming compassion that can allow us to receive forgiveness. And so I say to you, whoever needs to hear this today, whoever you are, whomever you have harmed, you are welcome to seek forgiveness. Whoever you are, whomever you have harmed, you are welcome to receive forgiveness. Once again, welcome.